and welcome again. This week's programme is all about game and poultry and we're going to kick off with a recipe for chicken which I think is an absolute winner. It's full of the most sublime combination of ingredients and one ingredient you might not have come across before which I'd like to talk a little bit about is this one here and these are saffron stamens. And what you start off doing is taking half a teaspoon of those and crush them to a fine powder with a pestle and mortar like this. Saffron is actually the stamens of the autumn flowering crocus, which is very appropriate. You just soak it before it goes into the recipe. And I've got here the juice of a lemon. So I'm just going to pour the lemon over it, give it a stir, and you can see already it's got the most wonderful pungent flavour, but also a lovely dramatic colour. As I said, this is a chicken recipe, and the chicken, first of all, needs to be jointed. Now, if you've got a nice, friendly butcher who'll do that for you, that's probably the best way. But if not, it's quite simple to join a chicken if somebody's shown you how. So I'm going to show you how. First of all, you need to have by you a really, really sharp knife. That goes without saying. But also, you might like to see these. This is a pair of scissors, kitchen scissors, that's got a special little dip in it here. And what that little dip does is makes it easy for you if you want to cut a bone. So a nice pair of scissors, a good sharp knife. Take your chicken. This is going to serve four people, and we want eight pieces of chicken. So you start off by taking your sharp knife and making your first cut through what we call the parson's nose. This is about three and a half to four pounds, this chicken. So that gives you your starter cut. Then you turn it up and sit it up into a vertical position like that. And where you made your cut, you put your knife in, and then you go straight down the back with the knife all the way down to the bottom. Then you open the chicken out, open it out flat like that. And then you need to cut these two pieces in half. And you'll see here there's a little sort of very flexible breastbone there. And you put the knife in the middle of the breastbone and go right the way through. And so now we've got two halves of chicken. Turn the one half over like that and pull it. You need to stretch it right out. I'm going to turn it the other way around. Pull it right out. And then what you'll see here is a line, a natural line like that. So that's the next cut. Take the knife down that natural line. And you'll find that it comes away. You've got to be quite hefty with it. Now we've got two quarters. The next thing we want to do is eighths. So we'll deal with this one first. And this is the leg and the thigh. Take the little bit of bone here off. And sometimes it's better to just pull that a little bit before you take it off. There we are. Turn it over this way up. And then you'll find another line where the drumstick sort of joins onto the thigh you'll see another natural line there. So the next thing you do is put your knife through that. Now, all the little bits of skin can be trimmed away to make neat joints, and the little bits can be used to make stock. Now we're going to deal with this joint here, which is the breast and the wing. First of all, the little wing tip can come off, and that can go into the stock. And now you just want to look at that and think, well, what's, what's an even portion? Like that. And then put the knife through that one. And if you find it a little bit difficult, get rid of the knife and switch over to the scissors. Sometimes you hit a bone, the knife won't go through. So just switch over to the scissors. And there you are. Right, well, once you've got your chicken jointed into eight pieces, the next thing you need to do is brown them in some really hot oil. Now, I've got a pan here that's been heating over a gentle heat with some oil in it. And you brown the chicken four pieces at a time. You've seen I, I've actually um, already seasoned them here with salt and pepper. The reason this recipe has been created is because in the last series, we did something called chicken bask, which was so popular. Everybody kept writing letters and saying, can you come up with something similar? And um, this is it. So we'll just wait now for those pieces to brown. Then as soon as the chicken has browned, you add a little bit more oil to the pan, and you begin to cook the rest of the ingredients. And here I've got two yellow peppers and two large onions. 
And I want you to notice that they're cut into quite hefty chunks because they're going to have long, slow cooking. They need to be quite hefty to start off with, otherwise they disintegrate. Now, they've just charred and browned nicely at the edges. That's how I want them. The next thing I'm going to add is spices. And I've got a level tablespoon of whole coriander seeds, roasted and crushed as we did on the other programme, and a rounded teaspoon of cumin seeds. So they're going to go in next. Closely followed by two green chilies, and these have been de-seeded and chopped. And that'll give the nice, a nice little sort of kick to the whole thing. Here I've got the stalks of two packets of coriander leaves. Just the stalks. The leaves are going to go in later. The stalks give a lot of flavour to this. And then I've got three cloves of garlic. Yes, three. Needs three. And they've all been um, finely chopped. So I'm just going to give that a little mix in now. It's all beginning to look really colourful and exotic. And then more ingredients. First of all, chickpeas. Now these are chickpeas that have been soaked overnight, six ounces of chickpeas. And what you do is either soak them overnight or you bring them up to the boil, boil them for ten minutes and give them three hours soaking. Then, before they go into the pot here, they've got to be simmered for twenty minutes. They just need a bit of initial cooking. So these are the chickpeas which give it a lovely bite. That's followed by four ounces of basmati rice, brown basmati rice. It's got to be brown because this is going to have an hour's cooking eventually. So stir the rice in until it's all nice and glistening and coated with oil. And the next thing we're going to do now is see to the liquid for the recipe. And the liquid is, first of all, half a pint of chicken stock, and you can make that with the trimmings from the chicken. Now to that I'm going to add a quarter of a pint of dry white wine, half a pint of stock, quarter of a pint of dry white wine, and then remember the saffron that we soaked in lemon juice, that goes in next. Wonderful, wonderful colour, isn't it? In goes the liquid. And then what I'm going to do now is add some lemon. Now, if you were in Morocco, you could get preserved lemons. They're not very easy to get here. So what I've done is I've got a thin-skinned lemon. And this is um, actually a, a Cypriot lemon. They're very nice. You need thin-skinned ones because you're actually going to eat the lemon. It cooks down. So what you do is put the lemon in with the rest of the ingredients, tucking it well down into the liquid. And then two more ingredients, two ounces of black olives. I know it seems like a lot of ingredients, but as I've said, you don't have to prepare any vegetables. The whole meal is all cooked in one pot. Now we'll just distribute the olives, and then finally, the browned chicken that's been nicely browned, that just sits on the top. You preheat the oven to gas mark four, or the equivalents, and it'll take exactly one hour to cook. And after exactly one hour, the way to test if it's done is to just take a grain of rice and a chickpea and just test it, bite it, see if it's done. And if it's done, this is Moroccan chicken. And all you need to do now, before it goes to the table, you remember we used the coriander stalks. Well, these are the coriander leaves. And then you just scatter those all the way over and take it to the table, by which time the heat will have melted them down. And that's just the finishing touch. And I hope you're going to agree with me when you taste that, that that really is a winner. And now, closely following that, is another one. You begin this one by cutting two chicken breasts skin on into five pieces. Place them in a bowl, then add a tablespoon of rosemary, a teaspoon of lemon zest, a crushed clove of garlic, and half a medium red onion. Three tablespoons of lemon juice, and three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. Finally, a couple of bay leaves, and leave it for at least half an hour, or as long as you can, even overnight. When you're ready to cook the chicken, thread the pieces onto skewers with the onion and bay leaves, and then place them under a hot, preheated grill. 
and grill them for 20 minutes. This is really nice served with some puy lentils cooked with the other half of the onion and some red wine. Well, now we're going to move on from chicken to a real treat at this time of the year, and that is pheasant. And I want to show you a typical British recipe for poached pheasant with celery, another star ingredient. Later on, I'm going to show you how to carve the pheasant, so I want to show you now how to make that easier later on. And that involves taking off um, the little wing joints that are here. And what you do is you use your thumb and you go in with your thumb and feel around the joint and what, what happens in here is it's a little sort of ball and socket and you can feel it after you dig around a little bit you can feel it and when you've got it like that take a sharp knife and then just cut around it so that if you cut all around that little socket there the wing will come away what you do then is you take those two little wings and you make some stock this recipe has three stages Make a stock, poach the pheasant, then make a sauce. And stock first, so the wings go into a saucepan. And then in goes the celery, some of the end parts. Onion next, one onion, cut in half. And then a carrot that's just been cut in chunks. And then I'm going to put in a bay leaf. Two sprigs of parsley. Nice stalky bits, because that's where all the flavour is. Two sprigs of thyme. And two sprigs of rosemary. A few black peppercorns and a little bit of salt and then that just needs two pints of water and this will go onto the heat and bring it up to simmering point and it'll take half an hour don't put a lid on it'll take half an hour for you to get a good well flavored stock ready for the pheasant then you strain the stock put it into a larger saucepan got to be um, large enough to hold the pheasant and then you just season the pheasant with some salt and pepper and you place it in the in the stock it's really nicest recipe very easy because you don't have to do any browning or sauteing just lower it into the stock like that then put a lid on as soon as it comes up to simmering point and give it an initial poaching time like that of 20 minutes Meanwhile, you prepare the celery, and what I've got here is the, the bottom half, the heart of the celery, and I'm going to trim it. Um, what you do is you leave the root bit intact, because that's got lots of flavour in it. And this is actually the right way to cut celery for serving with cheese as well. What I'm going to do is cut it into eight pieces, so it's in half, and then each half in half again so that it ends up into eight pieces. This is real comfort food, the flavour of celery and the flavour of pheasant. Now, after the pheasant's had its initial cooking time, you need to remove the lid and add another ingredient, and this one is shallots. And I've got ten shallots here. These are rather pretty little shallots. They're from France, and they look like little buds. Very nice. So in go the shallots, and then the lid goes back on, and you give it another 15 minutes cooking and after 15 minutes cooking you then add the prepared celery another 15 minutes and then it's all ready for the next stage when the pheasant is cooked you remove it to a serving dish and then you reduce the stock down to a third of its original volume and if you can see the line there you can see that I've bubbled that and reduced it right down and then when that's happened you then make the sauce. The third stage of the recipe is to make the sauce. And to make the sauce, you start off with three quarters of an ounce of butter. And then you melt the butter to the foaming stage. And then you add three quarters of an ounce of sifted plain flour. And this is the, the sort of classic way to make a white sauce. People worry because they think it's going to be lumpy. Now, you've seen the flour go in. You've seen it mingle with the butter, and I hope you can see very clearly here, there aren't any lumps. Because once the flour, once the fat and flour are melded together, you'll never get any lumps if you work properly at it. Now we're going to add the strained pheasant, reduced stock, little by little, using the wooden spoon all the time to keep stirring. Now, when the stock first goes in, you will see lumps appear. 
that because the fat has been blended into the flour, it won't ultimately be lumpy. What will happen is, as you add this bit by bit, it'll go into a sort of ball, a soft ball, and then as you get more and more stock in, you'll find you'll blend it. So it's add a little bit of stock, blend, then add a little bit more stock, then blend again. And you can see here, it's just all coming together. It's just the panic point is this. You put, you put the stock in like that, and you think, wow, that's never going to be a smooth sauce. But it is. All you've got to do is be patient and just keep stirring with your wooden spoon. And watch it. Just watch it come back to smoothness. And then what you end up with is this beautiful, lovely, smooth, glossy sauce. Just turn the heat down now. Let it cook for five minutes to cook the rawness of the flour, the taste of the flour, out of it. Then finally, taste and check the seasoning and add the final ingredient, which is two fluid ounces of double cream. Turn out the heat and the sauce is all ready now for the pheasant. Now I want to show you how to carve a pheasant. Insert a sharp knife as close as you can to the breastbone slice it down and then pull the meat away from the carcass, being quite firm as you do that. Then each half should be cut into two. Serve the pheasant and the celery with the sauce poured over and garnish with some celery leaves that have been first dipped in egg white and shallow fried. Well, we're just coming up to the party season now, so the next recipe I want to show you is a recipe for duck. And this is a duck terrine called riette of duck. And you start off with four or five pounds of quartered duck. What you do is you just take the quarters and prick each one with a fork, because duck always has a lot of fat in it. And what we want to do, first of all, is to get rid of some of the fat. Season the duck joints and then put them on a roasting rack and pop them into the preheated oven, gas mark six or the equivalent. After one hour, this is what the duck will look like, turning a nice colour there. And then what you do is you take each portion of duck and pop it into uh, a casserole, a flame-proof casserole, or you can use a large saucepan if you like. Transfer the duck over and what I want you to see now is if I take the rack out, it's rather hot, so I'm going to protect my hands. I just want you to see how much fat has come out of the duck. And um, we don't want that to be in the riette, so we're going to just drain that off and put it into a bowl. Don't throw it away, because it's absolutely marvellous for doing roast potatoes. Now I'm going to turn the heat on underneath the duck here and add some more ingredients. First of all, I've got a tablespoon of chopped thyme leaves, which I'm going to sprinkle in. Then I've got two cloves of garlic, which have been um, roughly chopped. They're going to go in next. And a flavouring called mace. This is the outer coating of the nutmeg, which has been pounded down, and that's going to be half a teaspoon. So we'll sprinkle that in. And then the next ingredient is this one here, 15 whole black peppercorns and these are going to join them and these are juniper berries. Now they're going to go in with the peppercorns and I'm just going to crush them up. If you haven't used juniper before, juniper berries grow wild both in this country and on the continent and um, the flavour of juniper berries, they're used in the making of gin. So if you think gin and you think juniper, you've got something about what the flavour is like. So, crushed juniper berries and crushed peppercorns in next. And then we're going to add some liquid, and the liquid is in fact eight fluid ounces of dry white wine. There's very little work involved in this, but there's quite a lot of waiting to do, so you need to start well ahead. Eight fluid ounces of wine, and then you put the lid on the casserole, Bring it up to a gentle simmer, and you can go away if it's on a gentle simmer, and leave it for just two hours. And after exactly two hours, the duck will have braised and become 
so moist that it'll just fall off the bones. So you just take a piece of duck out like that. Then you take the meat off the bones. And what you need to end up with is little shreds of duck meat. And it's all beautifully moist. And it's all flavoured with juniper and wine and mace. And then, when you've done that, you pile them all together. It'll take you about half an hour to do that. Into a tureen. This is a one and a half pint tureen here. And as you can see, that's a whole duck now shredded. And what happens is you pack it down very, very tightly with your hand. And then you pour in all the juices. You don't strain them. You just pour in all those lovely juices with all that flavor. Then you put a little bit of decoration on the top, perhaps a couple of bay leaves. And I haven't told you the whole story yet because it's going to have something else to go with it. It's going to have a cranberry confit to go with it. So put a little bit of decoration on it like that, which is juniper, cranberries, bay leaves. Then put the lid on. And you need to leave it overnight. And that's what's good about this, because you can make it in advance, leave it overnight, and then serve it with the cranberry confit, which I'll now show you how to make. Well, it couldn't be simpler, and it couldn't be lovelier. It really is absolutely divine. You've got the richness of the duck, remember, in the riette, and then the sharpness of the cranberry confit is just the perfect partner to it. Now, you start off in a saucepan with eight ounces of cranberries. In they go. And then you add the juice and the zest of half an orange to join them. Because they're sharp, they need some sugar, so I'm using two ounces of sugar. And then a tablespoon of good quality red wine vinegar. Next. And then finally, eight fluid ounces of red wine. Give it all a good stir, and then take them to the heat and let them simmer very, very gently without a lid. And you'll need to leave them there for an hour, coming back from time to time and just having a little stir. And then after one hour, all the juices will have evaporated and you'll have this lovely thick mass of cranberry confit, which is beautiful to serve with any game and goes especially well with our riette of duck. And now we're going to move on to another game recipe, and the game in question is actually venison, which is now available much more widely. And the recipe I want to show you is venison steaks cooked with a cranberry cumberland sauce. And I'm going to show you how to make the sauce first. You start with a, a small saucepan, and into the saucepan goes, first of all, the squeezed juice of half a lemon and half an orange. And then here, the principal ingredient is cranberry jelly. And I'm going to use two tablespoons of cranberry jelly. Now, Cumberland sauce traditionally is made with red currant jelly and served very often with game. But I find that serving it sometimes with cranberry jelly just gives um, a little bit of difference, and it's really nice. What we're going to do now is take that over to the heat, turn the heat on, and just Allow that to start to melt, the jelly to start to melt into the juice. And while that's happening, I just want to show you the rest of the ingredients. Now here I've got lemon zest and orange zest, and this has been cut into very fine little shreds. And I just want to show you how to do that. You use half the zest of an orange and half the zest of a lemon. And you take a potato peeler, and what you want to do is get that really just the outer zest and none of the white pith. And that comes off very easily with a potato peeler. And then, using a very, very sharp knife, you can put them up into little piles like this. And notice there's hardly any white there at all. Put the strips on top of one another like this. Then take a sharp knife and just cut it into shreds. Now you're thinking, why can't I just grate it? Well, you can grate it. Or you could even use a zester. But I just find cutting it, shredding it like this, which doesn't take all that long, just gives a little bit more texture to the finished sauce and wonderful flavour of citrus peel. Now the next ingredient, let's turn my heat down a bit because it's bubbling away too much. The next ingredient is this, which is root ginger. Not very attractive to look at, very knobbly, but 
having a lovely fragrant ginger flavour. And use the potato peeler again to take the outer skin off and then using a grater what you need to do is grate about one teaspoonful altogether. So what I'm going to do now is just grate that and if you hold it vertically it comes off in little shreds on your grater. And then at the back inside my grater I've got about a teaspoonful. Now this is going to join the jelly which by now will have melted into the into the juices so that's next and then after that one more ingredient which gives it a nice little bit of a kick and that is mustard powder and I'm going to use a slightly rounded teaspoon of mustard powder and give that now a good mix so that's the sauce ready. Couldn't really be simpler, could it? Very, very easy. What we're going to do now is just pour it into a bowl and leave it aside for a couple of hours. It needs a couple of hours for the flavours to develop. But first of all, it's going to have one very important ingredient, and that is port. Um, and I'm going to use three tablespoons of port. If you want to, this is a very good keeping sauce. If you want to, you could actually make this two or three days in advance. Now what I've got here are two venison steaks and I've got either a dessert spoon or two teaspoons of peppercorns that have been crushed with a pestle and mortar and that's just going to give the venison um, a nice sort of crust, peppery crust. Turn them over, put some pepper on the other side and then they're ready to go in the hot frying pan. And when you're cooking any steak, whether it's venison, you need to have the pan really, really hot so that the steaks can be seared. In they go then. Now the cooking times, if you like your steaks rare, are four minutes on each side. If you like them medium done, five. And if you like them well done, six. Right, now we're going to turn them over at half time. And we've got another ingredient here, and that's two shallots that have been finely chopped. So I'm just going to sprinkle those around the venison. Then just before you serve, when the time is up, you pour the sauce into the pan around the venison steaks. Now that looks like too much sauce, doesn't it? But what we're going to do is just let that bubble for a minute or two. Just let it bubble down and reduce. And here it is. The lusciously thickened, reduced sauce. Serve the steaks with the sauce poured over. And that's it. Venison with a cranberry cumberland sauce. Well, that completes our programme now on poultry and game. Next time we're going to be cooking winter fish and shellfish. So don't forget to come back. Music